Hey guys, still there. Today in Steel Division, we're following Fufu Foo Foo Bear, who's going to be showing off the Guards Division. This is the Guards Armored Battle Group, and this battle group focuses around British made tanks, or at least some of them, as of course the British decks also tend to rely quite heavily, especially later on in the game, upon those jumbos. Or, um, not the jumbos, the Shermans. <coughs> Now, the Guard's Armored has some pretty nice and mobile stuff, but initially it does not pack a lot of armor, so you're going to have to make use of your mobility a lot more than your armor. Aside from that, your income in Phase A is not that good. You're only looking at 80 points. 125 points in Phase B is quite liberal, and from the battle groups that are deployed here, far more than anyone else can muster. Now, the enemy team has the 3rd Fallschirmjäger, the 352nd Infantry, and the Panzerlehr. This means that, especially in Phase A, the Panzerlehr is quite weak. I showed off this deck a couple of days ago, and I mentioned there that in Phase A you just need to survive. You just need to hold on long enough to actually bring in those actual tanks. I mean, Phase A... In the Panzer Lair deck, as much as it is an armored deck, it doesn't have any tanks. So you're stuck relying on infantry, a bit of armored, or sorry, a bit of anti-tank units, scouts, stuff like that is going to have to hold the line. Let's see if they can hold the line against some British aggression. Now also in this team we have Bad Kane and Dalton. Both of these guys are using the uh, 101st Airborne Division. And especially in towns, these Airborne Divisions are rather powerful. Outside of them, Short-range infantry fights, not that good, because they can get suppressed easier, and they are generally not that good at taking out stuff at range, at least not with the infantry. You're going to have to use some other weaponry for that. Now, in the meanwhile, Fufu Bear is going to be heading towards the left side of the map. It's nice and relatively open terrain here, where you should be able to use those anti-tank guns that he's bringing, uh, correction, those mobile units that he's bringing, the Humber Mark III's, and also uh, defend against infantry that might be getting too close to his forces. The question is, what is he going to find there? Because if it's going to be either of the infantry decks, he's going to be doing short-range fighting. If it's the Panzer Lair, he might be able to push through. And if he is able to push through, then the question becomes, can you hold on in Phase B? Can you hold on against all that armor that the Panzer Lair is guaranteed going to be throwing at you? Now, he starts off with a few armored units and quite a few transports, actually. We have the Lloyd Carrier with a machine gun, we have the Bedford with infantry inside. There's a Humber Mark IV, two of these guys, and a Cromwell Mark IV. This is a command Cromwell. The nice thing about the Cromwell, as opposed to some other tanks, is that this thing also has HE rounds. Not all of them do. Um, I believe one of the Canadian tanks, the Ram 2, does not come with HE rounds, which can really mess up your strategy if you're not prepared for that. This is his battle group going towards the right side of his flank, and they're immediately in contact with the Germans. This is Freedom Isn't Free with the Panzer Lair. They have a couple of Pumas here. Looks like they're also bringing in some infantry, and immediately the Humber Mark IVs get to work. Now, in case you haven't seen the Humbers yet, these things are pretty poorly armored. Only three frontal armor. They're very, very mobile. 28 kph off-road is very good in this game. HE, not that good, but AP at 7 means that they can pretty easily slice through the uh, armor of any of these units here. And if they get close enough, they might even be able to do the same thing with enemy tanks. Now, the left flank is not doing that well. We have one group of Reki and one Humber Mark III. This is the non-recon version of that vehicle. He's on their side of the uh, tree line here. And the MG42 is getting a bit too close. But this vehicle cannot just get up here. It can, however, use its machine gun. And is suppressing the MG42. But it's not able to save the recce. As there was too much firing at them. In the meanwhile, on the right flank, the Humbers, as well as the Cromwell, have the guys over here on the run. These guys are going to fall back in order to save their asses. In the meanwhile, this guy is able to make good process in uh, good progress in the, the loo of these forces retreating. 
So we have the rifles going towards this tree line, where at short range they will be able to do some infantry skirmishing, at medium range use their machine gun. For further fire support we have the Vickers HMG. If you can get these guys into a nice position along this field, they can do some overwatching and suppress any infantry groups that might be getting too close. Now a nice little column here, or formation uh, line abreast I suppose. I think that this is a bit risky, because if there's, well if there happens to be one bombing run, which okay against the Panzer Lair is not too likely, but any of his allies might be thinking, oh crap the left is falling, we're gonna have to help out. That means that both of these vehicles could get destroyed and potentially all of them could get panicked. So I would be in favor of spreading them out a bit more. But look at the headway he's making into this terrain. And being conquest, all that terrain you can capture is absolutely welcome. Another Humber Mark IV comes in, this one a recon version. We also, uh, we also have the Bedford coming in with more infantry. And the Humber Mark III on the front line here is slowly moving along this tree line in order to try and get some shots at targets because, as per the usual, they cannot go through these tree lines. So we're going to have to go around. Now just as the infantry is getting into position, the Germans are bringing in reinforcements. We have a 250-8. This is the one that's armed with a 75mm gun. And a 251-1 armed with a machine gun or two. So the infantry is going to have to scavenge to cover pretty damn quickly. Otherwise they're getting pinned down and there we go. And it's not the only unit. There's a machine gun deployed into this building which is having perfect line of sight on most of these units. It's just these buildings blocking their line of sight. Fortunately, this armored little group is still here. They don't really have the opportunity to circle around just yet. And unfortunately, one of the British forces was able to, or was forced to surrender due to increased pressure from the Germans here. So they cannot quite make their progress into this sector just yet. So he's branching out towards the right a little bit, trying to connect to one of his airborne buddies over here. Instead, he's running into the Fallschirmjäger. So we have the um, third Fallschirmjäger battle group over here. You can see that they potentially still have a group of infantry here. Otherwise, this loose here, or this, this, there we go, it's already disappearing. This notch of enemy controlled territory. Now some of these vehicles are once again forced to withdraw. Potentially the Humber Mark IV was able to get a shot at it. Yep, it is firing at the 250-8, the 75mm gun. Forcing it to withdraw and keep itself at distance. As another AEC Mark III comes in. Now these guys are, uh, well you could pretty much call them the upgraded variant of the Humber Mark IV. They have more um, AP value, 11 versus just seven. Definitely more frontal armor, eight versus three. But you're also paying quite a bit more for them. You're paying 125 versus 80. So it's actually quite the investment in phase A, considering that his income is only 80. But it has a nice gun, and it can deal with some of these units that are firing at it from the right flank. Hopefully fast enough, because you do not want to get hit by that 75 millimeter gun. Now the left flank was able to push through, and this is getting them more and more terrain. And at this point, the uh, German forces are bringing in a Stuka, trying to get a bombing run going. I'm just not quite sure what they're going for. And they might be getting chased down by the Spitfire over there. Spitfire is trying to hit the uh, Ju-87 here. It looks like it's going to... Yep, there we go. No more Stuka. Aircraft shot down. So how are we going to deal with this machine gun nest? Because our machine gun nest is heavily pinned down. But fortunately the Humber Mark IV is in position to help out. And the Spitfire, still armed with bombs, is able to deliver some ordnance there as well. And note how he's not immediately evacuating the Spitfire after it's delivered its ammunition. He's keeping it in the area to deal with enemy aircraft just as well as delivering bombs. This is done by turning off evac Winchester, making sure that the unit does not immediately evac once it's dropped off its ammunition. Now at this point we see a Panzer L6I coming in on the right flank. 
Unfortunately, the British rifles are not armed with an anti-tank weapon. So it's up to the Humber to try and deal with this unit. AP-wise, it can definitely do that. 7 or 11 points of AP versus 4 armor should be well enough. I just hope that not one of these Humbers is going to die in the process, but that's exactly what happens. If the Panzer fires once and kills off one of the Humbers. Fortunately, not the AEC. This one was able to survive. However, it's not actually dealing with the Panzer L6. It is not capable of looking at it just yet. So instead, it's going after something that it can see, which is right over here. Infantry. Now we have little under two minutes till phase B. And this means that the Germans are going to be getting reinforcements. Looks like the British... They're not throwing hand grenades, are they? Because officially they're not carrying them. We saw several explosions here. That was curious. Looks like he is trying to get a shot at the Panzer L6 here with his hum with sorry with his AEC Mark III. Missed, but the tank is forced to fall back completely on the run at the moment, and withdrawing behind these trees to make sure that they cannot see him anymore. Time for the AEC to go prowling, but first we have further reinforcements coming in. Let's see if we can deal with those guys before they're able to evac their vehicle. The left flank is making good progress, by the way. We have just one lonely rifle group, one Humber Mark III, and one six-pounder for anti-tank defense. And that's it. That's really all that he has on this end. So there's really very little in the sense of offensive capability that the British are actually fielding. But so far, they're still holding 55% of the map. Despite a pretty large aggression area here from the Red Forces. The Germans are definitely trying to make way here. I just wonder what's out there. Because it might just be one or two infantry groups holding this. And then just projecting a bit of force into this area. So that they're holding on to that section. Now with phase B 15 seconds away. It's the question of does the Germans. Uh, or does the German player here. Freedom isn't free. Have enough points saved up. Is he going to immediately start to uh, field quite a few tanks, or is he not actually in possession of that many points, and does he have to wait? Time for Cromwell 5 to join in. Cromwell 5, not particularly heavily armored. 7 frontal armor, but these things are fast. 33 kph, which is interesting, <coughs> because they're faster than a wheeled vehicle. And this is a uh, tank. I believe these were along the lines of cruiser tanks, so they're able to make quick use of uh, lines and or, uh, gaps in enemy lines, trying to push through those. But I'm not that well versed in British tanks and tank maneuvers, so I might be completely wrong there. At the moment, he's able to help out with the Cromwell against all of the German forces that are currently inside this town. And this town has seen some action. You can see that quite a few of these buildings have already been destroyed. The infantry inside has already taken significant losses. And so far, the armored support here is very welcome. Because right now the Germans don't have anything that they can use against that. The question is, how long is that going to stay that way? Not too long, unfortunately, as we have a command stook coming in. This command stook can quite easily deal with the Cromwell 5. Whereas the Cromwell 5 can deal with the stook. The issue is, which one's going to fire first? And which one's going to be more accurate? At the moment, the AEC Mark III is trying to make its uh, weight, or trying to pull its weight against the Stug. 8 frontal armor, 11 AP. Again, both of these vehicles can kill off each other if they want to. Fortunately, it seems that the Stug does not have the same amount of reconnaissance power that the Blue Forces over here have. So they might not be able to see any of these vehicles just yet. And hopefully, strength in numbers will work. The Cromwell is redirected to help out against the Stug. The Humber Mark III is here, the AEC, and we have another unit coming in. This Dingo is going to help with command, trying to get more veterancy in. Unfortunately, the AEC has been destroyed, and so has the Humber Mark III, because it is not just the Stug firing at them anymore. There is another vehicle that has joined the party, and I think it's moving along this road. At this point, the Cromwell 
is trying to still stay in cover and yet deal with the forces in here. And at the moment it's working pretty well, but not for much longer. We have an artillery strike coming in. Cromwell taking the brunt of the fire and is forced to retreat as it is not very confident anymore. Completely panicked, forced to withdraw. Another Humber Mark IV, ready to fire, is dealing with the forces to the right side. These Spetroops seem to be very, very hard to dislodge from their buildings. So we're going to have to just consistently put pressure on them. All the while, that Stoke is making progress, and we have a Königsteiger. This is going to be a real problem. As the British guns don't really have anything at the moment, at least not here, that can deal with 21 points of frontal armor. So, the one hope that we have is to just try and keep it knocked down. Try and keep it stunned, make sure it doesn't have the capability of moving up. So the Spitfire came over, dropped some bombs on top of it, but not enough. As the unit is just not panicked yet. Dalton has in the meanwhile called in an artillery strike on this position. Let's hope that thing is going to be accurate and not spread out its fire along all of the infantry here. That would be a real shame. The Humber Mark IV has been destroyed. So far it seems that the right flank is in trouble here. Left flank still doing quite well. The infantry here is at the moment completely unchallenged. And in case that there is an enemy tank coming this way, we have the motorized rifles. These guys do come with anti-tank weaponry. We have the uh, Piat 83mm heat rounds, which will absolutely kill off enemy armor. Would be the ideal weapon against that Königsteiger, which is still getting rather aggressive here. And at this point, he has nothing that can deal with that tank. We do have the 6-pounder. The 6-pounder at the moment does not seem to be uh, capable of firing. There we go. He's locking on. But he's not going for the Königsteiger. He's going for all of these uh, vehicles with autocannons. The 20mm guns are suppressing the anti-tank gun, forcing it to withdraw as the Königsteiger can just continue unmolested. One Aufklärer has been destroyed there thanks to the Sherman 5. We're gonna need this tank to get really, really close to the Königsteiger in order to kill it. Because it only has 11 points of armor piercing. And before it's going to be able to get to the Königsteiger, it's first potentially going to have to deal with the Stuk, which is getting rather close. Managed to get it one shot. There we go, no more Stuk. But now we're dealing with other threats here. Looks like we have an artillery observer here. Taking a nice amount of fire from the machine gun there, but not able to kill it off before it was able to make its escape. So the Sherman, is it close enough? Well, it is close enough to deal with this transport here, or this autocannon. Unfortunately, the Dingo was not in cover and was killed off by one shot from the King Tiger there. This is a bit of cat and mouse, seeing who can get close enough. If he can get a side shot onto the King Tiger, the King Tiger is history. But the King Tiger at this range is really, really accurate. And besides that, if this guy, there we go, is angling his frontal armor towards the... He got him. I was going to say if he's going to angle his frontal armor, he might not have enough AP to penetrate. But he got him. The King Tiger is no more. It's just a burning wreck. The Sherman V, or the Sherman V, is still pushing. It has not been hit yet, and is therefore not panicked. And with that King Tiger dead, Freedom Isn't Free is going to have quite the problem here, because right now, he invested well over three minutes of income in order to get that thing. And can he come back from that? Does he have enough forces other than that King Tiger, which was pretty much his whole linchpin of the assault here? The rest of these units were just supporting the King Tiger. But with the death of the King Tiger, he is now able to make some progress again. And these transports and fire support vehicles are really not doing that well. Now I've neglected the left flank a little bit in the last couple of minutes because the right flank, or his right flank, was just so much more interesting. And the left flank has actually been making really, really good progress. 
capturing almost as much as the positions towards the enemy reinforcement zone here. There still are some units holding this position, and the infantry, the uh, Humber Mark V, the M5HT is going to have to move a little bit further up in order to try and cut that thing off completely. Which will then only allow this land reinforcement route to bring in forces for the left flank. Cromwell 5 coming in, trying to get this transport, this transport, or crash in this uh, fire support vehicle. It is, however, pretty solidly behind the building. We're going to have to get really close, at which point it's risking getting killed off. So, for now, we're first going to have to deal with the Geppard, which is not an anti infantry or which is not a fire support vehicle per se, but can be used as such. It is an anti tank gun, nice and mobile, a pretty nice firepower on that gun. But it's not particularly heavily armored, as it's not supposed to be a frontline unit. One after another German vehicle gets destroyed by just the Cromwell 5 and the Sherman 5. There's another Cromwell to the right, trying to help out and potentially push onto this road. Maybe locking it down so that enemy forces that are coming down the road are immediately getting shot at. By at least the front from the, or yeah, at the front by the Cromwell, maybe from the sides by the Sherman 5 and the Cromwell 5. And there we go. Geppard's destroyed. Another bit of terrain captured. And at this point, Sean's had enough and surrenders. They're at 58% of map control, and this is going to be really, really hard to come back from. Now, take note of how he killed that King Tiger. The King Tiger, in an open engagement, is hard to kill. So what he did was use his, uh, here, his Sherman, through these terrain obstacles to block line of sight make sure that he could get close enough. As he wasn't able to kill it off immediately before he had that tank in position, he knocked it down, or at least tried to suppress it with airstrikes. That's one way to keep it on the defensive, and make sure that it doesn't have too much potential to move up and push into your lines. Which, if you don't have the anti-tank gun to deal with it, can be crumbling rather quickly. So, the third armor group. Uh, sorry, the Guards Armored Group. Uh, pretty powerful group, if you use them well. Make sure that you get close to enemy tanks, especially the higher level German and tanks, if you want to kill them off. But if you do, then they can definitely pull their weight. So, hope you enjoyed that. Let me know what your thoughts are down below in the comments. And if you like this channel and you want to support it, be sure to do so through the link in the description, the Patreon link. Any help you can offer would be much appreciated. That's it. Thank you for watching. I'll see you soon for more gameplay.